I love technology, okay? I love science. I wasn't, I'm not a scientist. I could have been pretty easily. A lot of people wanted me when I was young to go be an engineer, and I love engineering. I made my living from advanced computer technology for many years during the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s. And I have utmost respect for any scientist, engineer, or technologist, but I have to throw a couple of conditions on it. And this is it. That they are honest practitioners and do not falsify their craft, number one. And number two, that they are dedicated to the service of mankind and not to the control of it. If you go that far, I'm good with it. But I want to say that the trouble started as far back as 1800, or a little shortly after, when a philosopher by the name of Henri de Saint-Simon, we'll call him Henry from now on, uh, he's considered to be the father, by the way, of scientism, transhumanism, and technocracy. And uh, most of today's trouble could be traced to this guy. That's what he said. A scientist, my dear friends, is a man who foresees. It is because science provides the means to predict that it is useful, and the scientists are superior to all other men. This is a false notion. First off, no one can predict the future. Second, even our Constitution says that all men are created equal. And there's not a hint anywhere in there that says that some are created more equal than others. A modern scholar wrote, Central to scientism is the grabbing of nearly the entire territory of what was once considered questions that properly belonged to philosophy. Scientism takes science to not only be better than philosophy at answering such questions, but the only means of answering them. Another modern scholar wrote, with scientism, you will regularly hear explanations that rely on words like merely, only, simply, or nothing more than. Scientism restricts human inquiry. Once you accept that science is the only source of human knowledge, you have adopted a philosophical position that cannot be verified or falsified by science itself. It is, in other words, unscientific. And indeed, the introduction of scientism into various scientific fields has created the widespread practice of what is known today as pseudoscience. You've heard a lot of it here today. Well, you've heard a lot of debunking of it today. And to many, it's become a religion with an intolerant belief system because scientism is a religion. There's a great body of literature out there that speaks to this. It's an intolerant belief system that believes to, that seeks to punish the deniers and to ignore any facts to the contrary. They're blocked out. Thus, when science declares that it and it alone can determine the nature of reality and what must be done about it, I take great exception. And I expect you all do as well. I hope. Having clarified that, let me make the bold statement to say, I believe technocracy represents the greatest threat to humanity that we have faced since the cruel feudalism of the Dark Ages. And I want to today give you a brief sketch of what it is, where it came from, and how it has managed to permeate every level of every society and every nation on planet Earth. Let me ask, even now with a show of hands, how many of you have ever heard of technocracy before? Okay, down. How many have ever heard something from me, a video, a book, a paper, anybody at all, whatsoever? Okay, that's good. Well, let me take you back to 1932, when a group of esteemed scientists and engineers at Columbia University, and I'll say esteemed at the time, they maybe didn't stay that way, but um, they were nevertheless some of the brightest and the best that Columbia University had. I talked to one uh, professor about this when I said, well, technocracy started at Columbia University, and he laughed. It kind of took me, took me back. He laughed, and he said, whatever good came out of Columbia. 
I didn't know how to respond to that, so I didn't go to Columbia, but uh, apparently it has a reputation. But these engineers set about the task of saving the world from the Great Depression, 1932, right after the crash, and uh, it was a terrible time. They wrongly believed, wrongly, that capitalism was dead and that rigor mortis was setting in. So they set to work on, uh, you know, project to create a brand new economic system designed by them, of course, from the ground up to replace capitalism and free enterprise. It's a big task. It was the first time in the history of the world that anyone ever attempted to design a brand new economic system from scratch. And I'll tell you why I was interested in this in the first place. I've never been a practicing economist, for instance, working with a bank or the World Bank or the IMF or anybody else for that matter. But uh, that's my educational background and I've studied economics all of my life. This is of great interest to me. Somebody is building a brand new economic system. I want to know what it is. Well, this new system was called technocracy. That was their name, not mine. They completely discarded the price-based economic system based on supply and demand. By the way, we use money as an accounting system for our economic system. We're all familiar with it. Some of you have dollar bills in your pocket, some have plastic. In its place, they substituted a resource-based economic system that would use energy as its accounting system. Now, I know this is otherworldly to you to talk in these terms, but just kind of listen along. I think you'll get the idea. You've had hints of this already with some of the stuff we've heard this morning. They specified that private property and all other resources would be converted into a public trust managed by technocrats, of course. Those are the scientists, engineers, and technologists, which would carefully be allocated according to public need. And they pointedly intended to control all production, all consumption, by controlling the entire societal machinery with so-called data-driven science. Their brand of science, of course, by which that time had already been thoroughly soaked in St. Simon's brand of scientism. It wasn't really science. They thought it was science. They thought they could take their disciplines from physics or biology or, or geology or whatever and just simply roll those principles over onto the management of people and societies. It's just pretty crazy. Here's how technocracy was defined in the official magazine in 1938. Technocracy is the science of social engineering, the scientific operation of the entire social mechanism to produce and distribute goods and services to the entire population. Notice that they were the ones who delivered the so-called and developed the so-called science of social engineering. This is where it came from originally. That's kind of a frightening term to most people just to think about it. What is a science of social engineering? I didn't know that was a science. Well, they thought it was. It was hardly scientific. But note the scope of his operation. This is important. They talk about the entire social mechanism. They talk about the entire population. Even though the original technocracy group had been exiled from Columbia in late 1932, there's a lot of details I'm not covering, but that's in my book. Two early members went on to create Technocracy Incorporated, a membership organization based in New York. The co-founder, M. King Hubbard, was the principal author of the Technocracy Study Course, which is shown here, and it became the guidebook for Technocracy. And yes, that's the same M. King Hubbard. You recognize this guy, a founding father a founding father, not the only one, of the modern eco-movement that dreamed up the crackpot peak oil theory called Hubbard's Peak in 1954. M. King Hubbard was the co-founder of this technocracy movement at Columbia University. Now listen carefully as to how Hubbard described technocracy in the, study, in the technocracy study course. This is a verbatim. 
Technocracy is dealing with the social phenomena in the widest sense of the word. This includes not only actions of human beings, but also everything which indirectly or directly affects their actions. Consequently, the studies of technocracy embrace practically the whole field of science and industry. Now catch this, biology, climate, natural resources, and industrial equipment all enter into the social picture. There ought to be a light bulb or two going on now as to where we're going with this. There were only seven requirements listed in the technocracy study course by M. King Hubbard that, um, that were laid down in order to implement technocracy. This was a very complex thing that they had cooked up, you realize, and there was a whole team of scientists and engineers working on this, so they'd gone through a lot of studies and meetings and, and so on, and these, these seven uh, requirements were kind of the summation of the whole thing, and engineers are good about writing down requirements. You've got to hand it to them. They, they did a good job of that. But here's what they said. Register on a continuous 24-hour-per-day basis the total net conversion of energy. By means of the registration of energy converted and consumed, make possible a balanced load. Provide a continuous inventory of all production and consumption. Number four, provide a specific registration of the type, kind, etc., of all goods and services where produced and where used. Provide specific registration of the consumption of each individual, plus a record and description of the individual. Allow the citizen the widest latitude of choice in consuming his individual share of continental physical wealth. Distribute goods and services to <clears throat> every member of the population. Well, the technology to accomplish this obviously did not exist in 1934. But Hubbard in particular was a visionary. He'd already rubbed shoulders with the early IBM team that was at Columbia University at the same time that technocracy was. They were busy constructing the first tabulator, the Hollerith machine, that was uh, later taken to Nazi Germany, by the way, to keep track of trains and statistical analysis and so on. And they saw the trajectory of computational technology. They're confident that it would exist in time, even if it didn't exist right then. And indeed, today it does exist, right? The first two requirements of technocracy in the study course, specify the so-called smart grid for energy management that is being rolled out today all around the world. This is not just an American phenomenon, this is a global phenomenon. Smart grid intends to control energy down to the last little erg that can be squeezed out of anything, whether windmill, fossil fuels, or solar panels, does not matter. The next three requirements document the extensive surveillance of production, consumption, and people. And the last two show who is in control of delivering consumable items to every citizen based on their fair share. Who would decide what the fair share is? Not you, them. What about our political system? Well, forget it. They wanted to dismiss all elected officials including Congress and the President. Private property? Forget that, too. People can't be trusted with private property, they said. That's what got them into the big mess they were in in the first place. Savings accounts? No. Your unused energy certificates were going to expire at the end of the period that you were given them, so you couldn't roll them over and save them to the next period. There'd be no savings, no inheritance, nothing. Cradle to grave, I want to say slavery, but cradle-to-grave management where they make all the decisions for you. Well, technocracy increased as a movement to over 500,000 dues-paying members in North America. It was a large social movement, if nothing else, and then it hit the brick wall of rejection. We can be thankful for that, that Americans re rejected it back then. But capitalism began to recover. Lo and behold, it wasn't dead. World War II brought it back. 
The movement was banned in Canada. That was another black eye for them because the Canadian government thought they had some connection to Nazi Germany. So they banned them up there. I'll cover that some other time. That's a whole story in itself that would be interesting, a connection to, to Nazi Germany and Europe in general. And things fizzled out after that. Attrition set in, membership shrank. This is the headquarters today. It's, <laughs> it's based in Decaturville, Tennessee. I have no idea where that is. I saw it on a map. I, I got this off of Google Maps. There's technology for you. It, they were for some years in Ferndale, Washington. It was a town about as, probably as big as Decaturville. And you might be thinking this was the end of technocracy, but there's a whole lot more to the story. I want to fast forward to 1968. Go back to Columbia University. This is Hamilton Hall, by the way, with the statue of Hamilton right in the middle, of, right in the front here. This is where it all started in the first place. But a brilliant young political science professor had just coined a new term, technotronic. He admitted it. He suggested the world's endgame was a technotronic era that would be dominated by advanced technology and run by a scientific elite of scientists, engineers, and technicians. And in 1969, he expanded his thesis into a book that was called Between Two Ages, America's Role in the Technotronic Era. You won't find that book on Amazon. It's a blank. You can find it at Abe's Books if you want a copy of it. There's also a scanned copy on the Internet that hasn't been taken up yet. His name? Zbigniew Brzezinski. I became an expert, by the way, in the Trilateral Commission because I was about the only person that could pronounce his name. And I could spell it, too. Zbigniew Brzezinski. Not surprisingly, his book was a rehash of 1930s technocracy. When I first started, got aware of technocracy, I had to go back and read his book again. I said, oh, well, I think may maybe there's a, a connection there, and sure enough. Brzezinski's book was quickly noted by David Rockefeller, whose family, of course, was among the richest in the world. They had close connections, by the way, as through donations and so on with Columbia University. Rockefeller immediately saw the possibility of a new economic system that was resource-based instead of price-based. Okay, why? Well, three reasons. Number one, because at that time, the handwriting was on the wall for the end of money as it was known. You remember the gold was just about to be decoupled. Fiat currency was going to rule the world, and you know the end of it. Any economist knew, knew at that point the end of fiat currency is going to be wipeout. Eventually, it's all gone. How do you measure your wealth if money itself is gone? So Rockefeller picked up on that. Secondly, he knew there's per that permanent wealth is in owning resources, not owning or holding depreciated currency. And third, the Rockefeller family had always thrived on monopolies. This is well documented historically as well. And what better monopoly than to own all the resources? And I'll say this maybe a couple more times, but this is a resource play at the root. Getting a hold of the resources, take them away from you, me, and any public entity that we work with or are a part of, and turning it over to them for operation and control. By 1972, Rockefeller had already envisioned creating a super elite multinational organization that would be tasked with creation of this new global economic system modeled after Brzezinski's book. And again, just to remind you, there's nothing more than warmed over technocracy from the 1930s. Rockefeller subsequently took Brzezinski by the hand to Europe to bounce his idea off his elite cronies over there at the annual Bilderberg meeting. You've all heard of the Bilderberg group. It truly is a discussion group. They do not make policies. They do not write studies. They do not have study groups and so on. 
But these are the elite of the elite of the world. They get together and they smoke stogies and drink scotch. Who knows? But, but they get together and they talk about stuff. So they went over there. And they were so encouraged by those people over this whole concept that they returned and immediately started to work on this new organization and they branded their tagline. This is important. Their marketing tagline. They were going to create a new international economic order. And they drew their initial membership from Europe, North America, and Japan. And back in the 1970s, Professor Anthony Sutton and myself, as we collaborated together on Trilaterals over Washington, we figured the word new merely meant that they were going to somehow game the slot machine to where they could get more money for themselves and everybody else would get hosed. That was kind of right, but we missed the point. Nevertheless, they said new. And we didn't believe that that was really just, it was just a stretch of the word, but that now I know they really meant new, absolutely positively meant new. The name of the organization we know is the Trilateral Commission. Zbigniew so Brzezinski, David Rockefeller, the co-founders. Rockefeller family had been instrumental in creating and funding the United Nations over the years too, as we know. Their family gave the land to the UN that the UN building sits on in New York. There's a room a, a, that has a plaque in it at the United Nations building donated to the Rockefeller family, praising them for how helpful they have been. So it's not surprising that in 1974, the United Nations passed Resolution 3201. Has anybody ever heard of that before by number? Resolution 3201 called the Declaration on the Establishment of a New International Economic Order. How on earth did that get in there? And nobody ever heard of it, hardly. I've never heard it mentioned again. When I ran across it some time ago, I was absolutely shocked that they had slipped this in. But they began to seed the United Nations almost from day one. 73, the Trilateral Commission started. 74, lo and behold, a resolution at the United Nations pops up. And listen to the language. Having convened a special session of the General Assembly to study for the first time the problems of raw materials and development devoted to the consideration of the most important economic problems facing the world today. Boy, they hit the nail on the head, didn't they? That's the same thing that the Trilateral Commission said. There's something fishy going on. January 1977, James Earl Carter was seated as president, probably the worst president we ever had. I had to throw that in. He was a member of the Trilateral Commission. Wow. So was his vice president, Walter Mondale. Carter proceeded to appoint one-third of the U.S. membership of the Trilateral Commission to his top cabinet post and a few other high-level posts. One-third of the U.S. membership was in our government. It was a takeover, a clean sweep. But his first, very, very first appointment, however, was a big name of Brzezinski. And he was a national security advisor, President Carter. By 1979, I'm just giving you the key points here as it relates to our story. By 1979, Brzezinski had achieved his greatest victory of bringing China back onto the global economic stage. And you go read the history, you will see Brzezinski is single-handedly credited with being the guy who pulled it off. He promised to them technology, rapid development. Like, hey, we can make it, we'll give you a hand, we'll make this happen. And lo and behold, Companies connected to the Trilateral Commission, those multinational corporations, the giant ones, whatever, they lined up like a line at a Disney ride. They lined up to beeline over to China, start building infrastructure projects and factories and you name it, they built it. They supercharged China. Well, what kind of economic system did Brzezinski promote to China? You want to guess? Technocracy. They didn't have an economic system over there before that. Are you kidding? They were in shambles. They were as bad as North Korea is today. 
They didn't know which, way, which end was up. Brzezinski seated them with the principles, with his principles of the technotronic era and the new international economic order went straight to China. This will surprise you. By June 2001, some years later, just measure that from 87, 77 to 2001, Time Magazine, and I should mention that Hedley Donovan, the former editor of Time, had been one of the founding members of the Trilateral Commission. Time was one of the few press organizations that was allowed to attend the meetings. They couldn't talk about it, but they could attend. They nailed what happened in that intervening 20-year period of time. Listen to what Time Magazine wrote. The nerds are running the show in today's China. In the 20 years since Deng Xiaoping's reforms kicked in, the composition of the Chinese leadership has shifted markedly in favor of the technocrats. They use that word. It's no exaggeration to describe the current regime as a technocracy. They use that word. During the 1980s, technocracy as a concept, this is the article, during the concept was much talked about especially in the context, your bells go off for you political scientists, much talked about, especially in the context of so-called neo-authoritarianism. That's the principle at the heart of the so-called Asian development model, adopted by South Korea, Singapore, Taiwan, and pursued with apparent success. The basic beliefs and assumptions of the technocrats were laid out quite plainly. Social and economic problems were akin to engineering problems that could be understood, addressed, and eventually solved as such. The open hostility to religion that Beijing exhibits at time, most notably in a success, obsessive drive to stamp out the evil cult, Falun Gong, has pre-Marxist roots, has nothing to do with Marxism, in other words. It existed before. Key word, key phrase now, Scientism underlines the post-Mao technocracy, and it is the orthodoxy against which heresies are measured. Now, this is a fact. This is Time Magazine, written by a guy who knows his stuff. Other literature basically confirmed the same thing. China today is no longer a communist dictatorship. Yeah, they got the trappings. They still have the main great hall. Yeah, they have the red, the star, the flag hasn't changed. They look like it on the outside, but on the inside, they're technocrats now. Well, thank you, Dr. Brzezinski. You created a monster of technocracy that's trying now today to control the entire world. They've created and already enslaved their own 1.4 billion citizens into a scientific dictatorship. If you've been reading, you know what I'm talking about. That alone is almost 20% of the entire population of the world. And furthermore, China has already exported most of this technocracy, ideology, and practice to the entire Asian world. That's the so-called Asian development model. This represents now 61% of the world population. 61%. Really? Right under our noses and nobody noticed? We're talking over half of the world is already living in one, under one form or another of this technocratic system. Wow. Let's backtrack again. From 2001, Time article, Go back to 1983, when the United Nations convened the so-called Brundtland Commission to study ways to, develop, to implement and develop Resolution 3201, which you remember was the creating the new international economic order. Yeah, and it was headed by Gru Harlem Brundtland, prominent European member, by the way, of the Trilateral Commission. It's funny, she was selected to run this committee for several years, but remember, who gave the idea for the new international economic order 
to the UN in the first place. Not surprising in that light. It operated until 1987 and produced a seminal book called Our Common Future, which introduced the concept of sustainable development as a resource-based economic system with energy policy at the center. Sound familiar? This was the recast, recast lock, stock, and barrel into Agenda 21, in 1992 at the first Earth Summit in Rio. And since then, the UN itself has widely praised Brundtland as being the singular architect of Agenda 21. Now I'll just suggest a question. Where did the policy for Agenda 21 come from? Where was it born? Well, it was born in the bowels of the Trilateral Commission starting in 1973 as the new international economic order. Bill Clinton popularized the phrase, it's the economy, stupid. Actually, it was James Carville that came up with it in the election campaign, but it kind of caught on, right? It's not political. This is economic. Now, you've already had an earful on Agenda 21, how it morphed into 2030 Agenda, New Urban Agenda, Sustainable Development Goals, Biodiversity, blah, 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 global warming, too. Suffice it to say for now, that sustainable development is the interna new international economic order, that is the technotronic era, that is technocracy from the 1930s. And the carrier of the, United, of the technocracy of the whole world now is United Nations. Let me give you a story. It's a true story. To his detractors, Dr. William Levingston, not Livingston, Levingston, was known as Devil Bill. He was actually an itinerant salesman with a phony name who created a concoction of oil and laxative. You doctors out here, what do you say about that? Oil and laxative. That'll cure you. And branded it as a cure for cancer. Since cancer was a dreaded and usually fatal disease back then, people would buy and try literally anything for a cure. And he'd explain in his pitch that it's a miracle, if his, this miracle cure was good enough for cancer, it'd probably cure a whole lot of other things, too. <laughs> well, when old Devil Bill came into town, he would mesmerize and trick people into buying his miracle cure. Occasionally, somebody would ask him, what's it all about? Sounds phony to me or fishy. He'd ride out faster than he came in. And it's amazing that he wasn't lynched or arrested along the way because he was truly a fraud, and he never passed through the same city again. <laughs> he had a reputation. He couldn't go back because people would start drinking this oil plus laxative. Well, you can imagine there weren't, <laughs> there weren't a lot of happy people around. I imagine they got sick from the oil, and then they were sick from the laxative to boot. But he always managed to escape. He died in 1906 at the ripe old age of 95. Earlier in life, he reportedly bragged, I cheat my, I cheat my boys every chance I get. I want to make them sharp. It's no wonder his nickname was Devil Bill. However, Levy's name was a fraud itself, fake. His real name was William Avery Rockefeller Sr., one of those sharp sons was John D. Rockefeller, who was soon to become the richest man in America, and grandfather of David A. Rockefeller, who's in our story today as the founder of the Trilateral Commission. I guess we can say that the, the nut doesn't fall far from the tree, does it? This is the scam of global epic proportions, bigger than the world has ever seen. And now a good con man knows that he has to create a sense of urgency in order to get the mark to move in his direction. Don't give the target any time to figure out that he's getting scammed. Got to do it now, right now. The unscrupulous tire salesman says as he looks at your tires, I wouldn't trust those tires to the safety of my children. The shady salesman says, 
The sale ends tonight, and there'll never be another chance to buy at this price. Urgency. Well, let me put it this way. The cannon fodder for the sustainable development scam, and it is a scam, is global warming. This was specifically and purposely chosen to drive a sense of urgency and panic people into clamoring for sustainable development. Sustainable development is the goal. Global warming is only the get with it right now and do it sort of thing to panic people into getting after it. And it's worked beautifully. We wouldn't be sitting here talking about it if it didn't. It continues to work today with a religious fervor telling deniers that they deserve to be punished. I'm not going to examine the climate hoax any further because so many people are going to already cover it here. Great stuff. But I do want to remember, and I want you to remember, through all this twisted plot, sustainable development is an economic system designed to completely replace capitalism and free enterprise. Let me prove this. Debbie already showed her sweet little face. Christiana Figueres. She is climate czar at the UN. In 2015, this is what she said. Read it carefully. This is probably the most difficult task we've ever given ourselves, which is to intentionally transform the economic development model for the first time in human history. This is the first time in the history of mankind that we are setting ourselves a task of intentionally, within a defined period of time, to change the economic development model that's been reigning for the last 150 years since the Industrial Revolution. Pretty clear? This is war. This is not just incidental stuff, oh, we're having a streak of bad luck here. This has been the goal from day one in modern globalization. And indeed today, the entire United Nations organization is stampeding all 103 member nations of the world to simultaneously throw out capitalism and free enterprise in favor of sustainable development, a.k.a. technocracy. Now to recap my presentation thus far, one prong of global technocracy has entered through China and exemplifies a more direct form of scientific dictatorship. The second prong is coming through the United Nations in the form of sustainable development. Nevertheless, they're still one and the same, and they're going to end up at the same place one day because they're working hand in hand. Now I want to talk a bit about the economic effects of sustainable development, generally speaking. I will contend that wherever technocracy and capitalism meet, and they do meet frequently around the world today, it creates a toxic stew where capitalism and free enterprise dies. The details of the so-called green economy or Green New Deal, which is now global in appeal, as you know, cannot work, will never work, and it will never achieve prosperity for anyone. It is a crackpot economic theory that absolutely positively cannot work. And I say that not only from my view as an economist, but also from other people I've talked to that have looked at it that way. It won't work. Period. It will destroy the world. It won't fix it. And the original framers of technocracy knew full well that technocracy was all about benefiting themselves at our expense, other than converting us into resources that need to be controlled, like we see in China. And there have been plenty of people over the last 25 years, by the way, who recognized this scam and sounded the alarm. The problem was nobody listened. I know you're listening. Let me give you a couple examples. Pratap Chatterjee and Matthias Finger, authors of The Earth Brokers in 1994, were direct participants in the UN meetings that led up to the Earth Summit in Rio in 1992. They were environmentalists of the original order that preceded globalization, and they were deeply disappointed in the entire process and outcome. They wrote this book. They concluded in the book, quote, as a result of the whole unsaid process, that's the UN Conference on Economic Development, unsaid, the planet was going to be worse off, not better. Here's what they wrote. We argue that UNSAID has boosted precisely the type of industrial development that is destructive for the environment, the planet, and its inhabitants. 
We see how, as a result of unsaid, the rich will get richer, the poor poorer, while more and more of the planet is destroyed in the process. How's that? Nobody listened to them. Maybe their books were censored. I expect that was the case. Let me give you another example. Toward the end of the Earth Summit, youth representatives were allowed to give their impressions of the process and proceedings. They couldn't vote, but they wanted to see what they had to say. So they selected a young lady from Kenya. Her name is Wagaki Mwangi. This is her 20 years later at the Rio Plus 20 conference. She worked then, at the earlier time, for the International Youth Development and Development Network in Nairobi. Her short, pointed, and shocking statement left many of the attendees at the closing statements in shock. Here's what she wrote. The summit has attempted to involve otherwise powerless people of society in the process, but by observing the process, we now know how undemocratic and how untransparent the UN system is. Those of us who have watched the process have said that UNSAID has failed. As youth, we beg to differ with it. Multinational corporations, the United States, Japan, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, have got away with what they always wanted, carving out a better and more comfortable future for themselves. UNSAID has ensured increased domination by those who already have power. Worse still, it has robbed the poor of the little power they had. It has made them victims of a market economy that has thus far threatened our planet, and it had at that point. Amidst elaborate cocktails travailing and partying, few negotiators realize how critical their decisions are to our generation. She was only 18, pretty, pretty smart for an 18-year-old. By failing to address such fundamental issues as militarism, regulation of transnational corporations, i.e. the Trilateral Commission, democratization of the international aid agencies, and equitable terms of trade, she said, my generation has been damned. How do you think they took that? Oh, you know, gasp. I don't think she'd give her another speech. <laughs> Sustainable development technocracy promise a utopia. They promise to save the earth, but the fact is just the opposite is true. They're actually destroying the earth, and there have been a, a line of witnesses like this who have stated exactly that. Just the opposite of what they say they're doing is what they're doing. In the 27 years since Agenda 21, global poverty has increased, income inequality has skyrocketed, the middle class has virtually disappeared. Cities are paralyzed with a homeless crisis that defies any technocrat solution. Concentration of wealth has consistently accumulated into the coffers of the global elite, who were in on the scam from the start and out of the hands of everyone else. And the goal of both attacks, Chinese style or sustainable development, is the same. Total control over all production and consumption total control over all re economic resources, of which you and I are counted about on the same level as a wheelbarrow full of dirt. I want to turn my re re remarks now toward a few current events uh, to demonstrate how the total control structure is being put in place to create a scientific dictor dictatorship of technocracy. And it is about technology, of course. Dr. Parag Khan is a global scholar working out of the U School for Public Policy in Singapore. He's a self-confessed technocrat. He wrote a book in 2015, by the way, called Technocracy in America. You can buy that book. Who reminds me of a modern day Zbigniew Brzezinski. He really does, a very brilliant guy. The global elite love this guy. He's already written seven, well, I don't know, I don't say seven, several anyway, probably 10 books now. And his book, Connectography, which kind of details how global trade occurs between global cities, he hit the nail on the head, absolutely on the head. Listen very carefully. He said, we're building the global society without a global leader. That's a shock. Global order is no longer something that, we, that can be dictated or controlled from the top down. And he said, globalization itself is the order. That's kind of revolutionary. What he's saying is that the system is the order. The system. It's ruled by algorithm. 
by artificial intelligence, by ubiquitous surveillance of every part of society so that the system can be automatically managed, controlled, and directed. Wow. This attitude is pretty twisted, but let me give you an example of the mind of a technocrat. I studied this. I want to know the mind of a technocrat. I want to get inside their head. Hanhai Foxconn is the largest assembly company in the world. Based in China, it makes most of Apple's iPhones and iPads, among other things. It employs one million people, actually more than that today. One million. And it's pretty much known as a sweatbox company to work for. Hanhai chairman, Terry Zhao, made this remark at the year-end meeting in 2011, responding to questions about the high rate of suicides in their workers, among their workers. And you may remember the scandal that hit the news here about Apple, you know, Apple working with this company and all these people are killing themselves. He said, quote, Han Hai has a workforce of over one million worldwide, and as human beings are also animals, to manage one million animals gives me a headache. Isn't that nice? He subsequently hired the director of the Taipei Zoo, <laughs> Chen Shi Xian, to help him learn how to control his animals so that they'd stop committing suicide and embarrassing the company and his clients. It's true. With such an impersonal view of humanity, it's easy for technocrats to manage humans like a herd of animals. Push them this way, push them that way, poke them with needles, force feed a ration diet. The system to accomplish this, the technology system, of course, is growing up all around us and the rest of the world as well. China, for instance, promises to have 600 million facial recognition cameras installed by 2020. That's next year. That's one camera for every 2.3 people. In one city of over 2 million people in population, this surveillance network can pull a person out within three or four minutes once the order is given. Push the button, find that guy. You can find him just like that. And the police show up about just like that further. China's also developed a social credit scoring system you might have read about that assigns all citizens a numeric score based on their observed and personal behavior. If you don't pay a debt or a fine or you hang out with the wrong people or you post the wrong things on social media, your score goes down. If it drops too far, you're automatically excluded. Automatically excluded, by the way, from all you know, routine privileges like enjoying um, other people enjoy, like being able to rent in a nicer area, maybe go to a certain school, uh, maybe buy a ticket on a high-speed transportation network. They have to take the slow bus. And if you have been watching the development rollout of 5G wireless technology, you might have thought it's just about cell phones. However, if you listen to the heads, the heads, mind you, the CEOs, chairman of AT&T, Verizon, and T-Mobile, you hear a different story. They're drooling over the full enablement of the so-called Internet of Things that is growing exponentially each year. The IoT, by the way, is a catch-all term for all connected devices, cameras, sensors, smart meters, self-driving vehicles, home security systems, financial technology, and so on. The point is to track everything that moves in real time. And 5G is almost magical. The throughput of data is an order of magnitude greater than 4G, but the real benefit is in the quality of latency. That is, the time it takes to make a handshake with another device. Over 4G LTE, my iPhone, for instance, has a ping time of 33 milliseconds. At my office in Phoenix, I have a really fast Wi-Fi router that can ping another server in nine milliseconds, and that's pretty good. By comparison, 5G has a ping value of one millisecond or less. This is essentially a real-time digital connection. And Verizon itself is reportedly laying, catch this, 1,000 miles of fiber optic cable every month that will connect its 5G antennas that are being spaced anywhere from 500 to 2,000 feet apart all over America. The Verizon CEO said in a speech earlier this year that, quote, 5G will usher in a fourth industrial revolution. That's pretty important. And that it will be, quote, a quantum leap compared to 4G. 
Verizon issued a press release last June. Here's what it said. The Internet of Things refers to the rapidly expanding collection of devices that collect, transmit, and share data via the Internet. At present, roughly 8.4 billion things make up this universe, known as commonly as the IoT, from cars to appliance to wearable tech that represents a 31% increase from 2016. And by 2020, some 20.4 billion devices are forecast to connect. And by 2025, that number could swell to 55 billion. The release goes on to say, as the trends suggest, anything that can connect will connect. And the breakthrough in sensor technology, software, and analytics are, are posed to disrupt countless industries. But the key to ensuring those connections <laughs> are strong is building a network that is able to handle whatever speed, battery life, or data loads those device devices require. And of course, for that, 5G is critical. It's been said that data is the new oil of the 21st century. And technocrats lusted, lusted after data in the 1930s, and believe me, they lust after it today. Remember the original requirements documented for the tech, in the technocracy study course? A continuous 24-hour-per-day registration of the total net conversion of energy, a continuous inventory of all production and consumption, register all goods and services where, where produced and where used, data on every person, including de description and personal consumption. Yeah, 1934. Well, all the points of collection are realized by the Internet of Things, and the data is harvested and transmitted. It's going to be made possible by 5G for the first time in the history of society, real time. And believe me, this is a technocrat's dream team fantasy, to be able to model in real time all functioning parts of the society in order to apply their so-called science of social engineering. Artificial intelligence algorithms need data in order to learn. In fact, AI is absolutely worthless without data. And to the technocrat mind, there's no such thing as too much data. Finally, analysis capabilities, however, are catching up to be applied to the massive storage bins of historical data. That's not enough for technocrats. They want to do more than sift through historical data. They want real-time data. This is their nirvana to have a real-time flow of data coming in to train their AI programs to do what they want to do. 2001, Director of Intelligence at the time, Lieutenant Gen General Clapper, coined a new discipline called geospatial intelligence under the program of mastering the human domain. The technology has been proved on the battlefield, but has rapidly been adapted in the so-called smart city concept that seeks to overlay all of this technology onto human settlements. And GeoNet literally maps the entire human domain and overlays it onto traditional mapping systems. By tracking the location of all people in a targeted system, they quickly subdivide and into naturally associated groups and networks. And these could represent any group, such as a friend or family network, social groups, religious affiliations, political meetings, and so on. And if you observe people long enough with enough detail, not only do their personal patterns emerge, but also their relationships to the groups to which they belong. The whole discipline of GeoNet is moved forward. And ultimately, the fulfillment of George Orwell's Big Brother Nightmare, they say, this is the GeoNet people, instead of watching 20 or 30 people at a time, location-based services now can monitor thousands or even millions simultaneously. Today, as in China, we could raise that count to the billions. If there's anything else you take away from this presentation, I hope it's this. There's a fifth column of actors in our society, now the global society, that fully intend to conquer the world. While political drama has dominated the news cycle for so many decades, this column has marched forward with precision that only a skilled engineer could execute. Few people have paid any attention. Fewer still have connected the dots. If we could name Zbigniew Brzezinski as the intellectual father, I think we could, of modern technocracy and sustainable development, I have a feeling he probably understood General Sun Tzu uh, in the art of war, who said the skillful leader subdues the enemy's troops without any fighting. 
He captures her enemies without laying siege to them. He overthrows her kingdoms without lengthy operations in the field. With his forces intact, he will dispute and master of the, and have mastery of the, of the empire, and thus, without losing a man, his triumph will be complete. This is the method of attack by stratagem. If this was in Brzezinski's mind in 1968, he was indeed a genius. My Democrat friend, and yes, I do have a friend who is a Democrat, Rosa Corey, fully understands Agenda 21, Sustainable Development Center. She speaks forcefully against it. She's clearly seen through the scam, and she concludes most of her talks with this. It is the inventory and control plan for all land, all water, all minerals, all plants, all animals, all construction, all the means of production, all food, all energy, all information, and all human beings in the world. My friends, we cannot allow this to succeed. Americans rejected technocracy once in the 1930s, and we can do it again. If we lose this battle, the historical clock of liberty and freedom is going to be reset, and it'll push mankind back to a society last seen in the dark ages of feudalism. May God help us in the coming years to reject this. Thank you.